um, but the Skypod just steps it up that much further. Um, there's a couple things I really like about this. The double pull gives you a ton of length, but you can just pull these to extend them or and then push to retract. It's super easy. And it's got tons of adjustment really quick. The whole thing is made to be very quick to adjust. And then with the head tilt, you can watch the head. It'll go like 170 degrees. So if you have a, like a, say a side, side, uh, sideways rooftop or some weird kind of slope, this thing will just go, you know, anywhere. And you don't have to fight leg. A lot of times I don't even have to adjust the legs. I just can't the rifle and away we go. So uh, Skypod's definitely worth it. I, I have a couple. I have uh, single, double, triples, and uh, they are awesome. I use them and I loan them out like crazy. And once people use them, they go, wow, I had no idea. So that's the higher end. The, uh, the one of that newer is the ground pod. Uh, this was released a while ago, um, but people are now just kind of figuring out how cool they are. And they're quite a bit cheaper than the sky pods, but they, they kind of share some of the same features, right? And um, really quick to, to extend and then to retract, easy push button for your angle. So you can go front 45, uh, fold it up all the way down. It's very fast. Uh, rear tension. The head's got, a, you know, uh, I don't know the exact degree is, but it's got quite a bit of, of movement for your cant. It doesn't lock pan or it's locked pan, so you can't swivel it. Um, but a really nice uh, price point features. Uh, really stable. I've been really liking these. Uh, they come, this one's got a, a pick rail on the top, but they come either pick or Arca, whereas the Skypod, you can get the uh, BTC head that has both built into it. But awesome little lower cost option, the uh, ground pod for MDT. So um, yeah, that's what I got. I mean, MDT owns, you know, a few companies, like Matt said, they've kind of really pushed, pushed the envelope. They bought what, long range arms. So the send it levels. Yep. Yep. Uh, and they bought Skypod, which we had Sky on a while back, um, that designed it. And he came out, you know, and talked about it a little bit. And then uh, JAE, J. Allen, uh, they're back. I noticed one in your background there. Yep. Um, I mean, MDT's done a lot of different things recently. And it makes, you know, sense to partner with somebody that's come out with so many things. And I've had MDTs for a long time. Um, I'm super excited because I'm getting the new... Uh, Oh, what is it? The new, the brand new chassis, the, uh, the elite, the elite yep. in the blue. So I'm going to try that for some reason. I got a thing with blue lately. I don't know why, but they stand out. I mean, they're, it's one of those things that when somebody sees one on the line, they're like, Oh, that's good looking rifle, you know? So, um, another one that I really want to hit on real quick is uh silencer central. Now Silencer Central has been doing big things. They've gotten set up as a dealer to a couple different uh, companies like Silencer Co. So now you can buy Silencer Co. cans through Silencer Central. Um, the cool thing, I was just on their website, and I wanted to kind of hit this real quick. Because if you've looked at the Long Range Tactics page, I did a video a while back on how to get a suppressor or a silencer. The cool thing is Silencer Central went even further into... Um, how to make this easier that now they you can go on there and you can build an NFA gun trust uh, on the website and you know do all that if you want a gun trust with your family or friends or something like that. The cool thing is is this new easy pay plan um, from Silencer Central. Now what you do is you go uh, purchase the can and it breaks it down into I believe it's four easy payments um, while you wait for your can. So you're not paying for your whole can up front. Um, while you're waiting for your paperwork to go through, which takes a few months usually, um, now you can break it out into payments so you're not having to, you know, cough up that entire amount up front. So, and the cool thing is, is it's uh, no fees, no interest. So it breaks it down, makes it super easy for you to go out there and get a suppressor because we all know, especially with hunting, I never hunt without a suppressor now. I love it. Um, but it makes it easy for everybody to be able to go out and afford a suppressor. And they've got a lot of options, the banish, um, the silencer coast stuff. They've come out with a bunch of pistol silencers. They've got a lot of stuff. So go check them out at silencer central. They're one of our new gold sponsors, uh, excited to uh, start messing with those and, and really, you know, see what it's all about because I'm, I love suppressors. I got a bunch of them and I freaking love them. Um, it's just smart. Um, and then here a little, bit, a little bit later in the podcast, I'll break out and I'll introduce our, our other sponsors. But we kind of wanted to go over match safety. Now, a lot of times we'll kind of roll our eyes because you've got 
a lot of times one or two people. Well, no, I guess there's three people. You've got the ultra Gestapo freaking safety Nazi out there that, you know, is just everything. They're watching everything. Um, don't want to don't want to do anything wrong. Or you piss them off. Then you've got, you know, the average guy that just kind of moseys around, doesn't pay attention. And then you've got the dude that just goes out there and flags the hell out of everybody and just doesn't care at all. I mean, that's that's honestly isn't what it is. Right. Right, Matt. Oh, yeah, it's a pretty good breakdown, man. Um, I, I kind of want to preface this by saying, you know, um, I've shot, I don't know, hundreds of matches now. I, I've lost track, right? Locals, bigs, whatever. I've been on both ends of those, you know, um, depending on kind of the venue and who's around and who the match director is and what they're putting down. But uh, I got to say, like, the safety aspect of it is everybody's responsibility, whether you're like back spotting or a the the shooting competitor at the time so it's it's on everybody not just one person you know and then i think that's where the the gestapo thing kind of comes into play because there's like this one person that you know is driving everything but really i mean if someone said something before it was an issue then that person doesn't have much to talk about so that's that's kind of where i want to go on this and i think a lot of people get lax or they're afraid to say something or maybe they don't know how to approach the situation um, it, it can be something minor, like leaving a mag in a gun or, you know, even though it's empty or someone's, you know, accidentally flagging somebody or something like that. Like, hey, these things can be combated with a, just a very uh, general conversation. So that's kind of where I want to start. This is on everybody. So and I know you've seen lots of really blatant stuff. I have some minor stuff all the time, but there's a way to handle all these situations. Uh and man, I, I talked about a couple this weekend that, you know, we had and some I've seen in the, in the, in previous matches as a competitor and as a match director. So I don't know, man, where do you want to go from here? So first off, hold on just a minute. For some reason, every time you talk, your mic is cut like it, it pop, 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 pop. Like it's too loud. Is it too close to you? Uh, my tablet's pretty far away. I can back up a little bit. Is that, is that good? Bad in between? It's, I can still hear it. I don't know what it is. It's almost like a cable or something. It could be on my end, but I only hear it when you talk. It like pops. You know? How about now? Good, good, bad, bad, bad. It still kind of does it. I don't know what it is. Hmm. Mm. Okay. I can try grabbing some headphones real quick if you want to do that. Yeah. Try it real quick. I just want to okay. make sure that it doesn't. Okay, let's try this. Sorry about that. I don't know what's going on. But I, okay. then again, I can't hear it, so. You're good. Yeah, for some reason, it just, it keeps, like, popping. Okay, one second. Let's try to fix this. We'll fix stuff on the fly. Not a big deal. Yeah, I can just edit that out, so it doesn't matter. All right, say something real quick. Test, test, test. Is that better? No, it's not. They're not hooked up. One second. One second. Give me. You're good.
says I need an app to use these headphones for some reason. <laughs> Go figure. It's our freaking. They're just, they're just headphones. I don't understand. Uh, Are you there? He disappeared. Can you hear me? I can't hear you. It changed, it changed your settings. One, 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 there two, you. two, two. There you go. You got it now? Yeah. Okay. That sounds better, okay, too. Okay, let's try this then. That okay, sounds more awesome. gooder. It doesn't pop. Now, anyway, so now I know. the way, now, the, now that everybody's like, these guys are idiots, we're leaving, because we had a bunch of people. <laughs> um, the, I want to break it down, right? And there was something that I didn't think about as a match director. I want to break it down as a match director, how you go into setting up a stage for safety, and then as a competitor, what to look for going on into a stage. Now, we've both done both, so we can kind of bring some light here to this. Um, now, for instance, in one of my matches, um, I stuck everybody in uh, trees. Uh, it was super thick. There was very little place to lay a rifle down in a safe direction. Um, you know, and it's just one of those things like I screwed up and I didn't think that portion of it through because I was worried about targets. I was worried about everything else. And I didn't think about how, um, the, the, you know, the, uh, the way the rifles were, um, you know, set up and I wanted to kind of go over that and maybe talk about what you would look at, at a stage going into it to be safe. So from the match director point, uh, you have hundreds of things to worry about, everything. So, you know, it's, it's almost to a fault. You trust the experienced people and the other people to kind of be your safety ambassadors and to say something um, before something gets out of hand. Because you as one person cannot be at all these places at one time. You can't. So it's, it's really tough. So something will happen at the other end of the range. You need to be there and then potentially things happen everywhere else. So you have to rely on the people running your stages or the, all the other competitors. ROs are a luxury. They really are. So, and, and you know how hard it is to actually get range officers, one, get them at all, and two, get experienced ones. That's two separate things that are just almost impossible to line up. It just doesn't happen, especially your local stuff, your one-day stuff. It's I have been to very few matches that actually had dedicated ROs that kind of were there to usher and chaperone everybody. So it, it just, it just, man, it's super tough. You have to trust those that those those experienced guys are going to say something, or anybody say something, or take the take the necessary steps to make sure something doesn't happen. But like I said, you have to almost trust that to a fault. Um, so. I have seen some matches where a safety person was enacted and man, it was just, it was, to me, it was a little over the top because they were looking for things. 
They were just like laser focused, looking for every single little thing. And it was just a little overbearing. Now, I'm not going to say it was wrong. I can't. But um, it, as a competitor, it was kind of like, all right, man, I got it. I, I was three seconds too late putting my chamber flag in. The rifle was clear. I verified that. But I was three seconds too late. I set my rifle down. That put it in. Okay, sorry. Um, but I, and I, I've seen some, some just overbearing stuff and, and really redundant match rules. I mean, there's one very popular place that you know, requires you to take your magazine out of the rifle before you move positions. Whereas nowhere else is that is that the norm. It's it's like no, you just make sure that bolts up and back, or the safety's on the semi-auto, and the rifle's pointed in the in down range, the safe direction, and you just pick it up and move, and then you continue firing. But there is the one place that takes it a step further, and every time you pick up that rifle from somewhere, it doesn't matter. That that magazine comes out back into position, magazine goes back in. I don't know about you, but I only have two hands, so that's a lot going on. If you have a rifle, a bag, or a tripod, and a in a magazine so that to me kind of is um well kind of productive you know and you you talk about triggers and you talk about here's the way i look at it i don't trust triggers never have just nope. it, they they don't work sometimes they get dirty the you know the sear sticks down things like that i always tell everybody i've never seen a rifle with an open open bolt shoot anybody it, it can't nope. it doesn't work it cannot go off no matter how hard you try you can slam the bolt forward on the round. You can do whatever you want. But until that bolt is cammed into place, the trigger can't release the sear to go anywhere. And the sear is stuck in the fired position. So it's like, I I get it, you know, and I always tell everybody, I say, I don't give a shit. Everybody talks about trigger safeties. I'm like, dude, I don't trust trigger safeties at all. Never have, never will. Um, yeah, they're great in hunting scenarios and stuff, but even then they're, they're still dangerous. But, you know, a bolt open... I don't get it. Why would you need to drop your mag? Because then you know how many rounds, how many different rounds are so finicky with mags. And then you run into that yep. feeding issue, right? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I don't get it. That's that to me, that's over. But you know, a lot of people uh, yell at people coming off the line with a mag in and I've done it. We've all done it. You know, Oh shit, shit. I forgot to drop my mag. Cause I'm still thinking about stage adrenaline still going and everything else. As long as that bolt is open, you know, you can tell somebody, Hey dude, your mag's still in, just drop it, you know? Yep. And, and yep. Th there's definitely a way to be able to talk to somebody about that. But, you know, as a match director, I, I do think that's overwhelming or overbearing in my opinion, you know, to do that. And the way I would look at it is if, if the bolt is open, you know, and you can see, you can see light in there or whatever else. I mean, they're fine. You move, just keep your freaking muzzle down range. Right. Yep. No, I'm with you. Um, and that's, that's the norm. So, and, and the hunting side of this too, I know a lot of people that'll carry a rifle to round the chamber with safety on, but I will tell you from the thousands upon thousands and thousands of rifle rounds I fired, semi autos and, uh, bolt guns, bolt guns, especially it is super easy to flip that safety. You'll do it inadvertently running a bolt super fast and you'll actually flick the safety on and it'll lock, lock the rifle up. You go to shoot and you're on target and you're holding your wind call and uh, dead trigger somehow hit the safety so it goes both ways on that so i just i don't trust safeties either i i just don't and someone's gonna be like well you know you could probably carry a pistol with one on the chamber well that thing is completely covered in the holster uh, i'm not playing around with the trigger or the action on that so that's, that's a little different um but i don't carry a firearm in the field uh with around the chamber i just that's my personal i don't do it i don't rely on safeties at all i'll leave that thing all the way forward on fire and just use the bolt so yes, and I carry an empty chamber and in the hunting situation as well. Well, you know, goes. and more and more people are going towards the route of everybody wants a super light trigger in a PRS rifle. So they think they need a super light trigger in a, in a hunting rifle, which if that's how you feel you need to do it, great. But that even adds even more inherent risk to the issue because now you bump that trigger even a little bit wrong sideways or anything and that sear releases and that pin goes forward, you know, and you've heard the horror stories about guys shooting their buddies and stuff in the back because they weren't paying attention. And you already get buck fever when you're freaking hunting and you get jittery and everything's going a million miles yep. an hour. And you're just adding more ways to have issue there. Now, I, I, you're going to have the, the hard hit battle of, well, well, you know, it takes me too long to load my rifle and everything else. And it's like, well you know, maybe go to the range and practice that because honestly, how long does it take to orient chamber around real quick? It doesn't. 
Mm -hmm. It it doesn't. It it doesn't take that much time. Um, so maybe we talk about a few ways. I've seen people um, get DQ'd for match at blatant safety, and we can dive into each. So I've seen NDs, and people like to mix up the ND80 thing. We'll get into that. So the ND80 thing, uh, unsafe weapon weapons handling, uh, i.e. dropping a rifle or anything like that. Um, the flagging thing. Um, I mean, what else? There's just blatant, like, uh, habitual infractions where the sky loading thing where someone's closing their bolt, they're not even on target, they're looking up in space and they're closing closing the bolt and they do it over and over and over and over. Uh, you know, a lot of match directors will stop and, you know, or match scenarios. Like, I like to look at it as a teachable moment, right? If there's a teachable moment that we can stop, pull everybody back, if a DQ happened, if a DQ happened or – you know, something potentially bad, like, hey, all right, let's stop, let's just talk, let's observe this, everyone learns from it, now we all know not to do it again. You have a teachable moment, no one's in trouble, we'll roll through, and, and that's great. Um, so the, the ND80 thing, I've actually seen this. Um, I've never done it personally. I just, my rhythm is different than that. Um, but I have seen it, and I've seen people lie about it, and that's, that's not okay. If it happens, it happens because when you're competing, you're blurring, you're, you're riding that fine line, right? You're riding that fine line to push and excel. So, yeah, you're going to come into in the situations where you push too hard and that, that happens. So, um, but the ND thing, you know, that's typically defined as sending around and you didn't mean to. Like, that's, that's the crux of it. And AD, people like to say, well, it's, it could be mechanical. I have seen mechanicals. I've seen a particular brand of trigger have mechanical, you know, failure and fire. I have seen it. But as long as that bolt is closed and you're looking at that target and that happens, yes, it's bad. It happened, but it's at least contained to that area. You're not sending around somewhere where it doesn't belong, right? That kind of goes to the sky loading thing. You can't guarantee that your trigger is going to work every time, just like you said. Mm -hmm. You can't. You trust it to, but you can't. And then um, the ND thing. I've seen people ND at a target and hit a target and <laughs> one call themselves out on it. That's happened. That actually happened at one of my matches. I know it's happened at big matches. I've seen it. And I've also seen NDs happen. They miss, you know, like six feet off to the right or left. And you're like, okay, something's not right there. You know, mm -hmm. what just happened? Or I've seen them slip and torch one right into the ground in front of them, but it's right there. Danger close. I've mm -hmm. seen it. Um, that's pretty blatant. Um, I've seen good shooters call themselves out on it and be like, hey, I didn't mean to touch that. And depending on the match director, this is the gray areas here. Depending on the match directors and their set of rules, if they call themselves out on it and they were within some scope of the target or they hit the target or something, they'll go, okay, no harm, no foul. Mm -hmm. Now, whether you want to, your opinion on that is that's your opinion. And it's up to the match director to set those guidelines and have everyone fall. The second thing on that is, um, you know, a match director can go the other way. Like, no, man, you didn't mean to, you didn't mean to. And I can't have unsafe weapons handling and hey, have a nice rest of your day. Hang out and yeah. uh, smoke a joke with everybody. I don't know. You've obviously run big matches. You've encountered some of this stuff. You've seen it firsthand. I mean, what's your thoughts on it? I mean, one of the big issues we had was what we called the Utah moon dust. And it, it didn't matter whose trigger it was. It was in everybody's trigger. And a lot of guys, you know, I've preached to people, do not oil triggers because that's one of the biggest mm -hmm. ways that you can, you, if you want to get into this NDAD club, oil your trigger. That's going to be one where you're going to get in there because it just collects all that shit in there. And then your sure doesn't work right. Uh, you know, the lighter fluid's the best, but, um, this is the way I look at it. And I guess I was super laid back with a lot of this stuff. Look, you called yourself out. You understood there was an issue. Um, you know, and then we talked to the RO. Okay, how bad was it? You know, we kind of go through a, a checklist. Now, the shooters spent a lot of money to get there. You know, they're away from their family. They've done everything. And I think that needs to be broken out. And that, that needs to come into consideration, too. Um, you know, is this someone that keeps having this issue? Um, is this someone that... Uh, you know, everybody in the squad uh, has seen kind of do some unsafe handling type things, you know, and then we can go that route of, hey, you know, you probably need to get out of it. But if it was completely accidental, it was in the direction of the target, um, you know, maybe maybe what you do is, and this is something you got to think about as a match director, maybe you just cut that 
that um, that particular uh, stage out of their thing and say, look, you know, you've learned from it. Take that stage, throw it out. It still burns a little bit, especially, you know, if you're in top 10 and you lost the stage now, it's like, fuck that, that hurts. That's going to make me think next time. Um, rather than, you know, kicking somebody completely out of it. Um, I, that all comes down to, to the match director. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah. So let's look at, let's look at other shooting sports and this exact topic. And then I've got something else I want to propose to you and see what you, how you feel about this. So uh, USPSA, IPSC, slash 3Gun, they all have their own set of rules that what constitutes, you know, ND and unsafe firing. You know, it's, it's a distance to the target if that bullet strikes a certain five feet, five yards, whatever that number is, to the target that you intended on shooting, then okay. And then a lot of, their, a lot of the times you'll see people shooting so fast, they might actually bump fire their, their firearm but it was in the direction of targets. Or if a round stays in a berm, but hits high on a berm, it's still within that contained area, you know, that's okay. Um, shooting three gun for years, yeah, I popped some shotgun rounds off that went in the back of the berm that I didn't mean to, but the current rule set at the time, that was okay. That's not actually a safety infraction. Carry on. You know, I have popped rounds low with, you know, pound and a half triggers, 1911 triggers, 2011 triggers. It happens, and, and sometimes you'll get dinged for it, and sometimes they, they turn around and go, hey, man, no harm, no foul, because it was in the direction of the targets, no harm. Okay, um, so I think you have to kind of look at each case, and, and this is – some people will say there's no gray area, but I think there is, like you just brought up. like, And I think honesty will, will prevail if shooters um, aren't, like, blacklisted because of – safety infractions i think more honesty would come out of the situation so it's i'm not saying there's you know hey let's you know treat everything with with um you know big gloves like cushy gloves and you know uh handshakes and hugs but i think uh the safety thing definitely needs to be covered everybody's responsible for it but uh match directors should take the time to talk about things and deal with it on a educational basis and hey don't do this again have people you know, tell them what happened and instruct them, you know, and make it a teachable moment. And uh, I think a lot of people will be more um, apt to learn from that and be more honest about the safety stuff, right? And be more cognizant of it. But everyone's afraid. Everyone's afraid to DQ. Like that's a big thing, right? Because most DQs are safety violations, 99% of them, right? So everyone's afraid of that. Don't DQ. I've been DQ'd. It happened to me and my teammate this last weekend. I wasn't the cause of it. Hey, it doesn't matter. We both learned from it. I mean, we could have taken steps to avoid what had happened. Um, but hey, that's that's just it. I wasn't bummed. He was. He thought he let me down. I said, hey, we both learned from it. We're, I stopped everything, told everyone what happened. This is why. This is how we don't do this again. You learn from it until you see it and deal with it. You don't you know how it's going to roll. Um, but I do have another question for you. This is brought to me by a very prominent shooter. He called himself – uh, on an ND, the current rule book stated, yeah, he had a DQ, he had to be DQ'd for this. But his question was, and I think it's a very good question, if someone, say, was a full rev out on their rifle and sent that round way over it, but meant to send it, but didn't mean to be dialed that high, is that still a DQ? Current rules, no, that's not. Like, hey, they just messed up and i've seen this i've seen this at my matches where someone dials wrong sends that sucker over a berm and it's gone right and and i've shot never in a match but i've shot you know shooting long long range stuff and i forget to dial back down for being a rev out and that thing goes into the, into the mountains i can't say that i haven't but we look at that as less severe than someone torching one off you know near a target so that's that's kind of like i want to know your thought on that yeah, I mean, I've done it. I did it. I remember the first time I ever did it was on the Vortex Extreme. Uh, I shot it. I think it was like a 14, 1300 yard target. Went to the next stage, forgot to dial down, started shooting. There was no dust, no nothing. Everything was gone. And it took me two shots to go, oh shit, I forgot to dial back down, you know. Um, but yeah, you've got a point. But as a match director, we also need to know, you know, what is in the general background of that. So just you know, yep. kind, of, kind of think that. You know, I see a lot of match directors skylining targets. That's fine. 
but you got to know what the hell's back beyond that skyline target to uh to know you know i've been people have said it to me like dude you almost skylined that target what's behind it i said dude you're fine i know exactly what's back there uh we've mapped it out if it goes this distance it doesn't matter because it's not going to hit anything because there's nothing back there but um yeah you've you've got a point because honestly i know on some of these ranges where they don't have a whole lot of range sending something way over it especially some of these different calibers uh, but you know how do you catch somebody on doing that because most people are going to be kind of quiet about it you know they're not ever going to call themselves on oh shit you know i did that now just for and dial it back down and shoot yep. again so i i don't know and that's where i guess you as a shooter need to come into the into the thought process of all right do i say something or do i just keep shooting because we've all seen that we'll kind of keep an eye on somebody you know because you've got everybody behind the shooter watching and no one can see splash no one can see anything um you know it's it's amazing but in a lot of aspects all their buddies are on the squad so they're not going to call them out you know and they're not going to say anything either so i guess that's you know that's something you can think about too like should you call yourself out every time something like that happens? I, I, I don't so know. I, I personally have mm -hmm. on two different ways, being a match director and being a competitor. I've called myself out on, on things that were like, Hey, I don't think this is right. And I want to have that conversation to either find the left, right limits. Like, am I okay? Or am I not okay? If I need to DBQ at all, Hey, cool. If not, Hey, I'm letting you know this happened. So it won't happen again. Um, and then you know what to watch for, or hey, maybe something's not right. So, like this this last weekend, we we're shooting on a standing tripod stage, and uh, there's a there's a hill in front of you, that, so you had to shoot standing tripod, and the targets are kind of down in this recess, and so you had a standing tripod, and if you weren't high enough or in the right position, you couldn't see the targets to the hill. Okay, but the hill's about the top of the hill's about ten yards in front of you. So, my partner and I shoot the first target. And then we go to move the second one. I can see the second one. He can't. So his his Vulcan bolts up into the rear, and he goes, "Hey, I gotta move." And I'm I'm staying. So he picks up everything at once: the rifle, the twenty some pound rifle, the bag, and the tripod. Goes to move it. The gun slips off, and the muzzle goes straight into the dirt. And I said, "Hey, man, clear it. We're done." I stopped right there. Everyone else is staring at us like, "Hey, what's going on?" I said, "Nope. Hey, uh, this is just one of those things where." we're just done. That's, that's all there is to it. No hard feelings. And I stopped it like, Hey, this is what happened. Not in trouble. Yeah. We're just disqualified from the rest of the match. Like I'm not going to scold him or, you know, public humiliate him. Um, but Hey, that's what happened. Um, and, and we both learned from it and we had a great conversation afterwards. Like, Hey, I just know now that I could just could have just set the rifle down and moved over or just traded with you in your spot. And we could avoid it all this, but I rushed to do it. Okay. Hey, we learned no one got hurt. The muzzle was in front of us everything's fine. So, I mean, this is where it kind of breaks down into having a teachable moment. That was another instance of, of common DQ things with unsafe weapons handling. And like I said, when you put time restraints, and position restraints on people, these things are going to happen. It's, we, we act like they don't happen or can't happen, but they do. And that's the, that's the reality of competing. Just like auto racing, you act like crashes can't happen. Yes, they happen all the time. Um, that's because you're pushing that line. Hey, it's going to happen. So was that a, was that, what, what kind of match was that? The rules stated that if that happened, you were match DQ. Is that how yeah. the rules were written? Yeah. And that was my personal match. I was the MD and shooting with my partner. And mm. it's like, hey, and if you flag anybody, uh, NDs, anything like that, it, it's just, hey, I'm sorry. It's just, you should know, slow, slow each other, slow yourselves and each other down. You're shooting as a team. Nothing is worth that. Um, so yeah just done and, and you know that's a pretty general generally accepted safety rule too if a loaded firearm even though the bolt was up and back hits the dirt you know you didn't gain you weren't you didn't have positive control of your firearm and that's the most important thing you can let the tripod fall who cares about that it's not gonna hurt anybody mm -hmm. but if that if somehow something happens and that slides off and you torch around off that's a potential to hurt somebody so yeah hey, we're done but i call this i mean if I was a scumbag, I got to turn around, you know, within that rule setting, like, oh, hey, we're okay. He, you know, just lightly touched it. No, it, it don't matter. You know, it was it was better just to teach everybody that, that happened. And his muzzle, his muzzle break is filled with dirt anyway. I'm not going to send it around through that. 
I'm going to have them shoot through that. That's, that's even worse of a safety issue. Right. So isn't that how you clean out your barrel? Just load it. Full of <laughs> clean the carbon out of your muzzle brakes. Not <laughs> an effective way. <laughs> <laughs> not if you don't want a muzzle brake anymore. No, yeah. I mean, it just, it, yeah. I mean, and, and I've seen it other matches too. And I've also seen some match directors that are like, yeah, not a big deal. I mean, he, he has still had a hand on it. I was like, yeah, he didn't really because gravity was pulling against that and the ground was holding it up. So, uh, I don't, you know, just one of those things. Yeah. You got to look at that. Like what if he accidentally did leave the bolt closed and tried to move and mm -hmm. hit it, you know, cause then that definitely could have done it. And you know, that is a learning, a, a learning experience for him. And it is one, but you know, in, in instances like that, you've got to have the learning experiences that make the most impact on your brain. Like, you know, not just in most instances, a little slap on the hand doesn't trigger the, the, oh shit in your brain as a match DQ would, you know, and some yeah. people take that shit. I've seen it, you know, I was in Oklahoma a few years ago shooting one. The dude took it to heart, man. He was throwing shit everywhere. And I mean, he was just throwing a fit and he wasn't safe. He, he was dangerous as hell out there. And everybody in the squad called him out on it, you know, and that's the thing as a squad, um, you know, you've got to be kind of uh, an assistant to the RO because if you've ever RO'd, the RO can't catch everything. A lot of the times the RO is running the clock and he's trying to watch targets at the same time and he can't see all that, you know, and then you feel like a shitty friend for calling out your friend on a mistake or something. But I guess you could look at it like, well, you know, you could save somebody's life down the road if they're shooting like this and they're unsafe, you know, maybe we need to have a, a training or a teaching moment um, to do that. And, you know, maybe that's, maybe that's a good thing to do is, uh, you know, some sort of a training thing to, Hey, okay, before you shoot your next match, you could, you know, do this. And granted, knock on wood, I don't think I've ever heard of a match where somebody has been shot. Thank goodness. You know, but you get shot with only type powered rifles. It's not going to be good. Whatever you no, do. No, it's, going to be traumatic for you and everybody associated with that and not to mention the damage of of the sport so there's there's bigger things at play and as a match director from this whole situation because i was directly involved in it i had to seriously look at that stage i had already gotten complaints in that earlier in that day kind of that stage because the way it was kind of a ravine it was difficult it was tough right i i think looking back no i i sh maybe should have made that a little easier on people positionally uh, and, and reduced that, which is in the end of the day, yeah, I'm going to learn from that too as a match director. So if you're a match director and you're not paying attention to, to this, some of the stage and situations you're putting people in, then yeah, you're kind of doing a disservice to you and your, your, uh, your, your customers, you know, competitors. So I learned from every match that I run things that go well. And then I ask people for the negative feedback because I really want to know what they didn't like. Um, at the end of every match, I can tell everybody when I'm reading the scores, Hey, uh, more interested to hear the things that you didn't like, or the things that could be made better, uh, or situation stages, whatever, um, than the things that you loved. Because everyone, you know, while they're in front of you, is going to blow smoke. If you give them a little bit, they'll send text message, emails, whatever. And um, a lot of good comes of that negative feedback. So, um, yeah, looking back, I could have changed some things to make that better. And, and going forward, I, I learned from that. Hey, done deal. So, um, what are what are the other ones we mentioned? things well so you know. magazine magazine etiquette that's another big one mm -hmm. and man um if you just simply tell a shooter there's some shooters that get so spun up it doesn't even matter what discipline it is they forget that they have to end what they're doing they have they forget that they're like hey i've got certain things i still need to do in order to end this and i mean end this meaning they're completed shooting their time's done I still need to make sure my rifle is clear and I take my mag out and chamber flag if it's required and put it down in safe direction. There's still people that forget to do that. Uh, another thing I, I didn't hit as a, as a uh, match director. Um, one thing that you've got to think about that I didn't think about as good as I should have was properly training my ROs because they didn't know what to look for. Right. right. As an RO, they had no idea that, Hey, when these guys are done, they're, you know, a lot of them are just trying to get into the sport or they haven't really shot. And they thought it'd be cool to come hang out with all these guys shooting. They don't understand, you know, bolt back magazine out. What are you looking for? Um, every time you do it. And you know, if they leave the line with all that shit still going on, 
at, at, you know, at some point, that's what that RO is there for. Over everything, that RO isn't there just to call impacts. It isn't to run the clock. It's range officers to keep it safe. You know, and if your ROs aren't trained good enough or you haven't taken, you know, a 10 or 15 minutes to kind of go through and explain to them what they are, that's a problem too. Because if multiple people are coming off the line with a, an open bolt, but a magazine's still in, that's still a problem, right? Um, because somebody could walk back there, set their gun down and close their bolt because they don't want their shit clear full of dirt, which has happened before. Um, yep. You know, So that's another thing you need to think of as a match director is coming off a line and i think as a shooter um you know you can nicely tell an ro not be a dick about it but say hey dude you know uh from now on just make sure that you know kind of kind of help them because there's a way that you can do that too because um you know and then go tell the match director hey i recommend maybe you do this you know down the road or whatever but i see too many guys and girls try to be macho dicks and they don't need to be there's a way to talk to somebody and do, not talk down to them like they're an idiot yeah. because they miss something you know and that's been a, another thing that i've noticed a lot is that but again there are a lot of great people out there that that you know are legitimately like hey pull them aside and maybe that's what you do you know pull the ro aside real quick and not make him look like an idiot in front of everybody and just hey I'd, you know kind of watch this you know what i mean yeah no totally so there's been tons of talks over the years about doing some sort of in this realm uh, in uh, RO videos or some sort of training certification, whatever, what, what have you for this particular discipline. Cause there's a lot going on uh, just like USPSA does for their, you know, RO stuff or the NRA hits on some things. Like I did the um, NRA RSO course. I have an RSO cause it's required some of the ranges to uh, be an RO or run matches or, you know, anything to do with compet uh, competing um, and then it's a good thing to have too um, but there's no formal training in this discipline which sucks so you're right you you don't and if you're not an experienced competitor and you haven't done one or two you don't have any idea you don't you don't know what's you know right or wrong so and i've seen a lot of ro's that they come and they want to ro because they don't want to compete yet Okay, but they're still the guy that's being relied on for safety and scorekeeping, which sucks for them. That's a lot of responsibility for someone that, like, literally has no idea. Um, so, yeah, and but as a match director, like, as a – or a head match director, you've got a thousand things, and you have to keep everyone happy. That's the other part of this. So taking time – yes, I agree with you. It should be done. But realistically, it's very difficult to get that done. Just another layer, another thing that's got to happen with people that, you know, not everyone shows up on time. Uh, not everyone is going to listen to you. But it's just another thing. Uh, so I wish there was some sort of formal education as far as ROs go so you can see things. Um, a lot of it comes with experience. But uh, and Jess and I have, the, the wife and I have, have ROed several big matches over the last uh, couple of years. Uh, it's, fun, it's really actually fun to do. And... Um, I wish more shooters would take turns doing that as well. Just take one match off, give back, and then help other ROs and teach them too, because that will strengthen it. If if the shooters that have experience aren't sharing their experience, that to me is a problem. It, it really is. I I wish there was a better way to say it, but some people are just kind of selfish with what they have, what they've earned. They they think this is my knowledge, it's my experience. I'm I've got it. Well, if you don't help someone out with it, then you know what good are you doing? It's like the, the secrets die with you, right? So. Um, that's, I think that's another way too, because if you've got 20, 30 matches under your belt man, you, you know, what's going on, mm -hmm. you know, what safe looks like, you know, what right looks like. That's the key word. You know what right looks like. So that's, that's another thing I would call upon experienced shooters to, um, help with the safety aspect and scoring aspect to make everything better. Take that time. Like you said, pull it or RO aside, you don't have to, and I have seen shooters humiliate ROs. I have seen it in person. And that, and that point, it's like, I am not going to have a conversation with that shooter. I'm going to go get to the match director. I'm going to have a conversation with that person, and they're going to handle it. And I'm going to tell them exactly what I saw. And, you know, that shame on that person, right? Like, you don't need to do that. But I've seen people go after ours and yell at them for missing, missing uh, a point or, you know, missing some other detail, right? Um, or, hey, why did that guy get to do it? And I didn't sort of thing. So... Yeah, and that I had that issue on my match. I had a couple of my ROs uh, 
they after the match they said look dude i i don't ever want to come back i don't want to shoot this you ruined you know everything about this i got belittled berated told i didn't know what the hell i was doing blah 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 and i'm like wow for somebody you know that's donating their time that's pretty bad you know and that is kind of the way it should go you know you should be able to reasonably talk to the ro if you have an issue and if it isn't uh you know and i warned everybody after this i'm like if you go to the ro and you pull the shit you've been pulling i'll just kick you out of the freaking match that's all there is to it i don't care who you are i really don't um you know and after that people would start coming to me like hey you know i i got this point so i could go down there and in between squads, I could pull the RO aside and say, hey, you know, what went down? Explain it to me, you know, and go through that, uh, you know, and then talk to their squad. And, you know, by that time, you're kind of a detective, but you could piece stuff together pretty quickly on what was going on. And, man, I caught a lot of people doing a lot of stupid, shady shit. And, uh, you know, after a while, you just had to warn them. But, you know, it comes back to the safety aspect of things, too. It's like, you should know better. You know, you should know yeah. better on... Mm-hmm. Uh, on sky loading and everything else, you know, and you shouldn't be closing your bolt until your reticles, you know, right on or right near your target and then close your bolt, you know, and your trigger, your finger should be nowhere near your trigger until your reticles on target, you know, things like that. And that comes back into training too, as well, because there, I hear everybody talk about training, right? Well, we went out and trained, you know, we just shot off props. We didn't do anything else, but you never hear anybody train. Um, you know, closing the bolt, you know, going through that because it's boring. No one talks about it. Right. But that's just something that you need to add to your training as you're going through it to stay safe, to, to do that. Because a lot of us transition over to the hunting aspect. And if we get a bad, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? If we get a bad, you know, keep doing something over and over bad, how hard is it to get rid of in a situation yeah. where you get buck fever or you're already not thinking clearly enough as it is? No, for sure. I've had many a conversation with uh, other shooters, like, hey, man, this is what I saw. It's not really kosher. Just handle it. Some will, most, most are great people, and they just, yeah, not a problem. I'll fix it. Let me know if it happens again. Cool. And some people turn around, they just want to not be nice. You know, they think that you're uh, putting them down or belittling them. It's like, no, man, this is what I saw. This is for the better of everybody else, um, and especially you. So, and, and there's that stigma too like you're ratting on somebody it's like well no there's more at play here than just mm-hmm. your ego so mm-hmm. relax it's okay in that instance with with uh one of your ro's at, at the dog valley match i had so i remember that stage i think it was on the far right end of the the line it was the longer rated stage and once you got on that win those big squares you drop them and you just run that bolt i think it was two or three rounds per and you find that win you send those next two well in that case, and this is for people that don't have much experience with flashers, the ROs were relying on the flashers. Well, the, the flashers flash repeatedly. So they weren't catching. They weren't watching the rounds drop. They were watching the flashers. So they thought it was just kept flashing because you hit it once. But in reality, it was one, two, or one, two, three. I was sending those as fast as I could before the wind changed because it that place is unique for the wind. It really oh, is. So it was dropping it. <laughs> yeah. And – and the, the guy just wasn't catching it. I turned around and he told me my score. And I was like, hey, I think I hit a few more than those. And people are on the back of the tripods on glass too going, yeah, I'm pretty sure you dropped those in. Saw the trace go right in the target. But it's the RO that actually has the final say, right? You can petition them. So I let it settle. I talked to a few people to make sure that I wasn't messed up. Because you shoot tens of thousands of rounds, you know what you see. You know, especially in a prone position. You know, you're watching them drop. You know what's going on. So then I went to you and said, hey, this is what happened. Either way, I'm fine with whatever you decide. And later in the day, you went and talked to the RO. Said, okay, what are you doing? You figured out, hey, he's watching the flashers. You came back to me. He's like, he's watching the flashers. Give me someone else that can verify this. I gave you to someone else that could verify this. And he said, okay, I'll give you those two points or whatever it was. Put those back. And I said, hey, man, either way, I'm good with it. Just as long as this doesn't happen to the next person, all right. And that guy learned. Uh, but I, I'm not going to grill the guy in front of everybody. Which is not going to yeah. happen. I know yeah, this because- is a little bit off off safety, but it's still the RO topic. So, right, right, yeah, and most of them have never shot with any of that. You know, I think a lot of my ROs were new. Um, you know, and they'd done that, and they screw up, and they admit that, hey, I, you know, maybe I just don't know. Um, but you know, years after, I still have people message me, 
And they're like, you know what? The way you handled this scenario, um, you know, I, I really liked it because you didn't need to go out in front of everybody. You didn't need to, you know, wear your big boy freaking I'm a match director hat to make everybody look stupid. You could pull people aside and have a conversation with them, work things out and get through it. You know, and people were really happy with that side of things because not everybody needs to know what the hell's going on, you know, and that just gets in your head and it makes it a, a shittier time because, I mean, we could go into this all day because we have those bad apple squads that are just negative about freaking everything. And if you've shot enough matches, you know who some of the people are, you know who some of the squads are, and when they get together, it makes them even worse. They're like a freaking plague, you know, and... uh you know, that, that all comes into how all this shit works out too. But yeah, the safety aspect is one thing that we wanted to cover. It's not something super popular. People are probably going to yawn halfway through this and go, why in the hell am I listening to this? But it's something that I think we all need to do better on. Um, and understanding that you're not calling somebody out uh, and you're not trying to make them look dumb. You're just merely saying, hey, you know, we need to be safer uh, together. Because I don't know if you saw it. I think it was at K&M. Man, did you remember that picture that blew up where he's leaning? Yeah, on, safe, safe, safety third. Yeah, yeah. He's leaning on the muzzle of his rifle. And it's like not, not a good thing. The bolt was open. The mag was out. Everything was fine. But he was leaning on top of the rifle. And people lost their shit over it. And, man, it went 13 different ways. Uh, you know, the PRS got, it, it was just a nightmare. And, you know, that could have been handled so differently. And honestly, I think, uh, what's his name when he released a picture never even thought about it, but that just no. goes, to that just goes to show you though, that taking the picture, he should have seen that and should have been, Oh, Hey, Hey dude, put that down, put it, put it away. You know, don't be doing that. And no one called him out until after the fact. So tell me where that was right, too, because someone there seeing him do that because everybody's walking around, everybody saw him doing it. No one called yep. him out until it got in a picture on Facebook. And then everybody became the freaking safety Gestapo and called yep. his ass out on it. So where how was that right either? You know, well, it so there were several. Then. Yeah, it's several layers failed. One, the shooter two, like the support staff, the, the camera guy, the other shooters like several layers failed and yeah i get the argument like and and i i loved the pictures of people like with the the toe pads for shotguns for you know over under shotguns because that's how they rest their shotguns in their foot i'm not gonna say hey, i particularly like that either i'm on the mindset of i don't want anything pointed at me and that's just how it is like and i get it some people will like oh you ever put a magneto speed on a, on a rifle like yes um, so I get it. I get both sides of it, but that one was, in my opinion, just a little too far. And, and like the, the poor guy doing the photos, I mean, he's a good dude. It's yeah. just, he really is. And he devotes his time and does this like for free and travels and matches. And he's, he's actually a really good guy. Um, but I mean, it's created a shit storm and, 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 uh, blew up for not good reasons. And, uh, that guy, that shooter is obviously a top shooter. He's at the AG cup. Um, man got roasted. Mm -hmm. got absolutely roasted mm -hmm. so it was uh yeah not not a particularly bright time in the, the sports uh history but no. um i think we all learned like just don't do that but i mean that could come back to the same point as well you know well he's he's one of the top guys so i can't call him out you know no one is above the safety rules no matter who you are as a match director i'm not above safety as a top tier shooter, they're not above safety. As an RO, that no one's above it because at the end of the day, that's the whole point is we're there to have fun and we're there to be safe. And that that's something that you have got to go into it being okay. You know, we can we can all be safe and we can give, you know, there's people that have caught me coming offline with the mag and hey dude, your mag's in. All right, and let me drop it real quick. Thank you. I appreciate you letting me know. Uh, instead of hey jack ash your mags in or you know something else like, again there's there's a way to go about doing that i think 100 percent, 100 percent. and you don't gotta yell and scream at people like that's just that's hardly ever the answer um and you see like you're in the military you saw what happens with privates you can scream <laughs> that like yes it yeah. might have been okay in some instances I, i'm maybe not really but uh, you see what that person does they completely like lock down 
they they shut down and they're done. And they're they're just gonna know that was a bad situation. They don't want to ever encounter it again. They may not even learn from that. They just know yeah. like I'm not gonna go near that guy again. Yeah. We're, so. At the end of the day, we're there to have fun. We're there to do it safely. We're there. I mean, I've learned, I've met more friends in the shooting area. I mean, I, I I brag about this. I'm like, dude, I could pr- go to pretty much any state in this country and stay at somebody's house because we'd become yep. that good of friends over shooting. You know, and it would suck to ever lose one of those friends because of a stupid safety mistake. Knock yep. on wood, it hasn't happened at a match. But granted, if you do something long enough, something will happen. You know, the NRL ran into that issue. These dumbasses drinking, freaking, and shooting. You know, a little while ago, it's like, really? There's a time and a place for that, and shooting is not the place to do it. You know, and the same thing, I see all these guys out hunting, and they're all getting shit-faced, and they're going deer hunting and stuff, and you wonder why accidents happen. Well, there you go, because there's already yep. too many things involved in the hunting that you add the alcohol, and it makes it a 100 times worse. You know, it's just things that you think, would be common sense aren't to some people apparently yep 100 percent. all right what else is that it i think that wraps up pretty much the safety portion man it's 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 a lot and a lot of good things to think about um and you're right some people might zone out a little bit but think of some instances and then put yourself in those in, in those in those situations too and, and you never know how you're going to react to some of the stuff until it happens in front of you or it happens to you. So um, at least if you're thinking about this stuff now, it'll be a little easier to deal with and uh, maybe you'll not put yourself in a bad situation. So, right. And going into it, I think I need to watch myself better, you know, be, be accountable more um, myself. And I can set that goal as I shoot, whether I'm out, you know, at our range or at a match or anything else, you know, understanding that I need to be more there in the moment and accountable. And then also helping, uh, you know, ROs or anybody else that needs help along the way. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I agree. You know, circumstance, yeah, should be drinking and handling firearms. I mean, that's just, it's stupidity at its finest because, again, you've, you've already got so many factors in the equation. Now you're just, you know, making it worse and worse. And um, I, I don't know. We can beat the freaking bush all day long and do our thing, yeah. but. I think it comes down to each and every one of us is, you know, take accountability, understand what you're doing and watch your friends because at the end of the day, you want your buddies to go home with you and go drink a beer after the freaking match, you know, stand around the truck and do that. I mean, hell that's happened at all the matches I've ever been to. Everybody knows they know the trucks go to because it's got the big ass cooler in the back and everybody goes and hangs out and talk about all the targets they missed or they hit. They're all bitching because something happened. All the wind on that stage. It was it was the wind, or my my rifle sped up, you know, eighty feet per second. So I missed the whole rest of the mat. Well, I mean, we can go under those excuses. Yeah, yeah, all of the hundred excuses that I hear every weekend. Yeah, yeah, it sped up. Oh, well, all right, adjust your freaking shit and move on. <laughs> That's great. I love it. Um, finally, I want to thank our last gold sponsor, Optics Planet. Um, when. I went to these sponsors. I wanted to go to a sponsor that I could still utilize all my favorites. I love Burris. I love Leupold. I love all these different companies, um, Vortex, you know, and and the cool thing is, as a company like Optics Planet, it gives us the ability to test and to market all these different companies, but yet push, push one major company. So I, I want to thank Optics Planet for stepping up and helping us. The cool thing I'm going to do, and if you haven't, go check out our website, longrangetactics.com. What I'm going to do every month is I'm going to pull five to eight items that I really think that all of you would really like. And we're going to run specials only for our followers and for our listeners. So now uh, you can go get you know a bino that we think we really like and that we recommend for a screaming deal and you can only find it on the website. Um, and they've agreed to do some of this. I'm excited about it. They carry ammo. They carry a lot of different things. Um, if you use code LRT five at checkout, it gives you 5% off everything, including ammo, which they've never done before. And it gives you free shipping over 50 bucks. So you go buy ammo, you get free shipping, you get all that stuff paid for it and you get the 5% off. 
uh, again, but we are working on better deals. We're just in the infancy of it, trying to do it. But I want to thank Optics Planet for stepping up. Utah Air Guns, of course, they've been on for quite a while. If you want an air gun, check out Utah Air Guns. they got a lot of new cool stuff. Um, and they, they sell a lot of the stuff like the sky pods and that kind of stuff as well. So, um, go check out Utah air guns. And then finally, um, tack pack. I just got my, my next tack pack in the mail. If you haven't been on these things they are freaking awesome. I've got, I don't know what the hell I'm going to do with all these knives that I've got from it. I'm like a freaking, <laughs> I got so many damn knives, knives in these tack packs, but they're cool. I mean, they're great. I mean, they, they turn out to be good gifts for somebody else. Um, if you use code LRT at checkout and you get the top tier tack pack, they send you an extra $75 item, which is pretty sweet. So you can cancel it anytime. Uh, go check it out. Um, I appreciate you guys all, all the live people that have tuned in. We've kind of gone in and out. We had some uh, issues there, but we're learning from it. Um, and then all of you listening, uh, I want more feedback from all of you. I know a lot of people get scared, um, you know, messaging us. Uh, you know, we've got the long range tactics. You can message myself or Matt directly. Matt, I know also answers a lot of questions, but message us if you have questions. Uh, if you don't feel like going into the long range tactics group and asking a question, you kind of feel dumb for asking it, message us. It might take us, you know, a little bit to get back to you, but I do get back to everybody that messages me. Uh, and I'm sure Matt's the same way because yep. all in all, we have done this because we love the sport. Um Lord knows I don't make a whole lot of money from this freaking deal. So we do it because we want to see the sport grow. We want to help people grow and we love the shooting sports in general. I mean, that's the way it is. So if you have questions or if you have topics that you want us to cover, let us know. Um, one of the next topics we're going to bring in a couple of the LRT guys. And we're going to go back over a lot of the 22 stuff. Talk about it. Talk about kind of where the direction of the rimfire market's gone and Talk about trainers and things like that because we keep getting asked that a lot. 223 trainer, 22 trainer. Well, let's go through the steps of what we would ask if we're going to do one or the other and explain to you why we'd choose what we would choose. So that one's coming. 20, up. My 22s are, I've got a bunch of them. Those are some of my favorite firearms and coincidentally, some of my most accurate, consistent firearms I've ever owned. So, and you don't have to load for them. You don't have to load nah, for them. It's, it's great. Nah. <laughs> Especially now where you can't find primers or anything. I mean, hell, talk about that. Let's talk about freaking Federal 210s. I haven't seen them in years. I traded a guy for a, a thing of 210s, so I'm good for a little while. For a couple of weeks. Depends on how many you shoot. <laughs> yep. That's like cocaine. You lay that shit down. You don't need more about it. <laughs> that, or that. And frick, dude, I looked at the damn H4831 shortcut. I use it in my 260s. Eight pounder at Brownells was $440. Yep. 400 is the going rate for an eight pound jug of any of the stick powders now. It's insane. How in the hell are we going to keep shooting? I mean, that's, I don't know. It makes me depressed. That yep. isn't where we were supposed to be going. We're supposed to be going the other way cheaper, but it ain't working. I don't know what that ain't happening yet. No, that's the problem when everything's controlled by a couple companies. They can do whatever the hell they want, but I won't go down that road. Speaking of that, we are going to have Nalls or uh, Hodgson on here pretty soon, so we can beat them up with some of them questions. And me and Matt will go in and tag team there. Oh, I got some burning ones. Is Chris coming on? Is that who's coming on? No, it's their new marketing uh, director. I can't remember his name. I've got to get it dialed in, but no. And I probably need – Chris sent me to this other guy, but – they were worried about Chris. They were afraid we were going to beat him up or something. But Well, I've got a funny Chris story. Whenever we get the Hodgson people on, I'll, I'll, I'll love to share. <laughs> but, I mean, that's one of those you guys can listen to and, you know, maybe get the inside scoop on what the hell's going on because there's a lot of stuff that I understand from the industry that goes into primers and powders and stuff that a lot of people don't understand. And man, there's, it's, it's a deep dive when you really start talking and thinking about it. So anyway, I appreciate y'all. A lot of great sponsors. We're excited for this year. Go follow long range tactics, official group. Uh, if you want to be in a group with like minded people, uh, long range tactics uh, on Facebook, we've got a huge following there. And then of course the website, long range tactics.com. Uh, there's some reviews on there. Uh, I try to put deals and different things on there that I find. Um, and there's, there's a lot of great info on there. And of course, make sure you, to you subscribe to our podcast channels and, uh, thanks Matt for joining me. Appreciate it. Awesome. Anytime.